Now, so how do we go ahead and deal with the controlling the, the, the disease? First of all, the first approach is you control the vector. So the idea was if you could stop the transmission of the black flies to humans, over time, the human reservoir would decrease, people would die, and the, and this is really sort of the same approach that was, that was done with AIDS. Before you had drugs that can control AIDS, the idea you, you stop the transmission by stopping risky behaviors, and then gradually the reservoir would decrease. Then, of course, they developed the antiviral uh, drugs. Uh, the parasite, unfortunately, lives a long time, 9 to 11 years in the human body. So you really need a long time to actually have uh, growth. And the way they did this was by applying insecticides to control the black flies. Everything else that was attempted, biological control, uh, everything that was tried, nothing worked except these, these insecticides. And the vastness of this program is unbelievable. Every week, 35,000 miles of rivers were sprayed with insecticides. In some cases, for 20 years, to try to control these, these biting flies. Here's what the, the larvae, the aquatic stages, because that's how they decided to control them, in the water. This is what the larval stage looks like. You already saw a picture of the adult that was feeding. These are sort of worm-like animals. And in one of the labs later this semester, you'll actually see these black fly larvae, okay? And the, your GSI will remind you that this is the, the one we talked about today. And so what happens is using helicopters throughout this region, 35,000 miles of rivers were sprayed. Here's an application of pesticides. And what happened is that most of the time, about 75% of the time, we used this insecticide that's called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria. It's a bacteria. But what we found is that we had to use other insecticides, okay, these other six, on occasion. And the timing was such when we used them, when we were sure we could get recolonization of the animals that we didn't want affected by the insecticide. But what I want to ask you is, if we had an insecticide that worked very, very effectively, why would we worry about using six other insecticides? If we had one that we know worked, why would we worry about also doing additional ones. And this is right out of something that you heard from Dr. Holstenbeck. We would worry about... Wonderful. The organisms adapting and becoming immune or resistant to the insecticides. So what we would do is we would use this one insecticide and then we would periodically use these others to make sure that there wasn't resistance developing. How does resistance develop? Through what process of evolution? How would resistance develop? I was going to point to our guests and ask them, what do you think? How would resistance develop? Through what process? This is going to be on the test Monday for sure. The third premise of Darwin's natural selection. Natural selection. And a particular type of natural selection, which Dr. Holsenbeck mentioned, called directional selection. It's pushing them in one direction. Okay? So, you know it by Monday, okay? So that's one of the things that, that we, we found, is that you have to manage for resistance to avoid this insecticide resistance. Okay, and how does this work? Well, here's the black fly. It's got these little fans here. It's laying back in the water, and all these particles that it feeds on are passing over it, and all we do is make sure that the insecticide is in a particle, so that as it passes over, it catches it in the fan, eats it, and then dies. So that's really the, the very, very simple mechanism of doing that. Okay, but just quickly, the other approach is you control the parasite, the strategy of chemotherapy. So ivermectin, and any of you ever heard of ivermectin? Ivermectin is a veterinary drug that if any of you had a dog that had dog heartworm, you gave the dog ivermectin. Ivermectin is a veterinary drug. This suddenly... About 20 years ago, it's approved to use in humans. So now we can distribute it to humans. It only kills the larvae. It doesn't kill the adults at all. And the idea was to give an annual dose to everybody in West Africa who was over five years old. And the drugs were donated by Merck, a big drug company that's always in trouble with uh, uh, some of its products. And, uh, but they've actually donated for years uh, drugs for free. So. 
What we did in our program is we distributed drugs to almost 7 million people a year. And we did this using volunteers, teachers, uh, village-based healthcare workers. And one of the things that was kind of interesting, although volunteers implies that you, know, you, don't, you don't give them any money for this, is that the Dutch government gave us money to, to, to give us a, a, like a reward or a thank you for the volunteers. Because, you know, they would spend their own time going out and, and distributing these drugs. And so, you know, we said, well, we'll just divide the money up and we'll give everybody, uh, you know, $5 or $10, whatever it is, which is a lot considering that the household income is about $250 a year. And so we talked to the people, and what do you think they wanted? They didn't want money. Money's not useful to them. They wanted soap, because with soap you can reduce bacterial infections, and they wanted salt, because with salt you can preserve food. So that, when you think about it, that's probably what really matters. It's not money. It's what you can use to reduce disease and make sure you have a food supply. So here we have somebody passing out pills. And the way we did this, you know, all of you that are interested in medicine, you know drug doses are based on weight. But you can't go carrying scales around these little villages. So we had a, actually a length-weight relationship. And for example, at this height, this child would get, get uh, two pills. And below, below this, they would get, they would get none. We also had, you know, if you're ever looking for a summer job, we actually had a job of what we called fly catchers that would go around and they would kind of expose their legs like this. They make sure the rest of their body was pretty covered. And the black flies would come in and they were really fast. I mean, they would catch them actually before they bit them. And uh, then we would dissect them and see if there were flies that were infected by having the parasites with them. So there's always a summer job uh, that's worse than the one that you've, you've had. Uh, let, let's look at kind of the, we're, we're going to come right to the present. This disease is no longer of public health importance, okay? It's not been eradicated, but it's been brought to, it's very, very hard to eradicate anything. Uh, even uh, polio is not eradicated, or smallpox is not completely eradicated. Uh, it's a, a, no longer a disease of public health importance. Uh, almost 70 million acres are now resettled and food production in this area grows food for 17 million people that weren't getting food before. Really an economic success story as well. And then there's also the distribution system we use for, lymph uh, for uh, river blindness can also be used to control lymphatic filariasis. And this is another disease we'll talk about a little later if we have time. And uh, you end up having a reduction in parasite-induced anemia. One of the slides I've, I've often shown is of me standing with a bunch of Africans, and the Africans are about half my size. And everybody kind of smiles, aren't these cute kids? They're not kids, they're adults. They have such a high parasite load that their growth is, is stunted. Uh, this is lymphatic filariasis, okay? You can see this classic uh, condition. And of course, it results in kidney damage, physical disfigurement, and really social ostracism. So these diseases, river blindness, lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis is another thing, they don't kill you, but they that your life is, the quality of your life gets reduced tremendously.